This video is made possible by Brilliant. What makes for a good city skyline? There are a few ranking websites that might point towards an answer, but they're usually ordering them by the city's relative size, where bigger is better, or by personal travel anecdotes. I'm not really interested in either of these things unto themselves. As someone trained in architecture, I'd like to find something a little bit more in between. What are the qualities that we can look at to read, analyze, or otherwise appreciate a city's skyline? A skyline is bigger than any one building, so no single architect has the ability to compose it. But we can use architectural principles to evaluate it. And since we've been talking about the scale of the skyline already, the impression that it makes probably does have something to do with its sheer size, both vertically and horizontally. The size of a city and the shape of the skyline is determined by a few major factors. First up is geography. Are there any natural boundaries that limit the size of the city, like mountains or lakes? Geology might also be a controlling factor. Are there any underground opportunities or limitations for building, like access to bedrock for foundations, which might dictate building sizes? Also building technology. Are there limits to how tall we can build at any time based on the state of structural materials and fabrication, plumbing, or vertical conveyance technology at the time? And there is, of course, politics. Building heights are often determined by zoning laws, codes, or historical district laws, which might limit the height of construction. And then finally, we have economics. Is there sufficient financial reason for building tall in a particular location? To learn more about how some of this works, I headed to the Chicago Architecture Center to meet Adam Rubin, the architectural historian there. Uh, my name is Adam Rubin. Uh, I work here at the Chicago Architecture Center as the Director of Interpretation. The Chicago Architecture Center has had a model as kind of one of our showpieces. It's a pretty dynamic teaching tool that lets us look at the uh, loop section of the city and apply lessons to either other parts of the city or to uh, skylines in uh, cities elsewhere in the world. Using the model here at the Architecture Center, I think it makes sense to just look at some of the zones in the city of Chicago just to understand their differences. And there's basically five. And if we start here at the south, this is the South Loop area, which is starting to be built up with some residential towers. Then you have the Michigan Avenue street wall with the loop behind it. And that's where you'll find the Sears Tower in the background. Then there's the River Corridor with buildings like Jeannie Gang's Vista Tower, Trump Tower, and Marina City. Next up is Streeterville, where you'll find the Hancock Tower and a number of other commercial and residential towers around it. What we're looking at on the model here is the Michigan Avenue street wall. Uh, this is a one-sided boulevard where we have a completely built up uh, row of buildings on the west side of the street and uh, just park space on the other side of the street. Buildings along the side of it are all um, roughly a similar scale and all complement each other. The growth is mitigated because this is a uh, protected uh, Chicago landmark district where any changes to that Michigan Avenue street wall do have to go through the Chicago uh, Landmarks Commission for approval. All this talk about growth has me thinking about a good way to discuss the qualities of a skyline might be to use terms and concepts from garden and landscape design. In particular, I think the picturesque style gardens offer a great way to think about skylines if you were just swap out buildings for trees or plants. The picturesque originally denoted a landscape scene that looked as if it could come out of a painting in the style of the 17th century artists like Claude Lorraine. So there's a reliance on a particularly pleasing view. Next, the picturesque is marked by a carefully calibrated sense of variety, irregularity, different scales, asymmetry, and interesting textures. But altogether, these individual qualities should be in a visually pleasing balance with one another. So I think if you're looking for perfection and you're looking for something that is pleasingly symmetrical, uh, maybe a city skyline isn't the place you should be looking. Part of this metaphor is also useful for understanding the relationships of the parts to the entire whole. In gardens, you have the scale of the flower. Flowers make up a bouquet, and a group of bouquets make up a garden. Skylines might also naturally break down into the scales of buildings, blocks, and then cities. Part of the picturesque quality that I'd like to use to evaluate Chicago's skyline has to do with the imageability of the city. Depending on where you approach a city, you're going to get a different prioritized point of view of what that city looks like. In Chicago, we have a lot of different vantage points to look at the city. Firstly, it comes right up to Lake Michigan. This hard edge presents a natural position from which to take in the whole. Some particularly good places to do this are at Navy Pier, a pier from World War II repurposed into one of the biggest tourist destinations of the city. Or if you are on the main branch of the Chicago River at the mouth of Lake Michigan, 
uh, you have a really unique canyon where you can look through the middle of the city, but really get a full view of the, uh, the large high-rise buildings on either side of the river. And also Northerly Island and the museum campus, which we'll visit in just a minute. But right now, let's head upstairs to continue thinking about the picturesque and its value in judging the character of a skyline. Up here, there are some more models of a totally different scale. They are enormous and create a fictional skyline using real buildings from different eras. There are also a few mock-ups of how their facades are constructed. Here in our skyscraper gallery, we have models of a handful of buildings that were at one point in time uh, the tallest in the world or sort of a defining structure um, in their respective skylines. The Home Insurance Building, which was here in Chicago, completed in the 1880s and demolished in the 1930s. And this early building presents as if it's part of a street wall. It's not really just a singular object in space. It's meant to be part of the urban fabric. The silhouette remains constant, with the top maintaining the same size and shape as the bottom. The Sears Tower, on the other hand, tapers as it gets towards the top. This reduces the impact of its shadow, reduces its windward facing surface area, and the irregular shape also helps to disperse the wind. And the tapering shape also makes the top lighter and easier to hold up structurally. So later, as skyscrapers developed, taller buildings often can have a more expressive silhouette in the skyline than, say, a cluster of older buildings from, say, the late 1800s or early 1900s might have. But by the 1920s and 30s, this is when this kind of tapering was actually mandated by most cities. This was a 10-story building, about 100 feet tall. Looks very, very different than the building next to it, which is the iconic Chrysler Building in New York City. Not only is the Chrysler Building a whole lot taller, it is shaped by uh, a zoning ordinance that New York City adapted in 1916, recognizing that sunlight and air wasn't making it down to the street level of people who were um, living in New York City. But also part of the story, in addition to the building's shape, are the visual qualities or the textures that are inside of that silhouette. Older buildings, like that first one that we looked at, might have a terracotta facade. Or like this mock-up here is of the Monadnock building, which is a building that was made all of brick. The windows are really deeply recessed into the facade, creating a deep pocket of light and shadow. Newer buildings, however, tend to be made out of steel and aluminum or glass in their facade, which tend to be much thinner, as examples in the model over here on my left. So they don't allow as much depth and texture to be expressed on the facade. Smaller residential buildings, on the other hand, might include balconies protruding from their masses as seen in the model of Marina City over here. Marina City was the largest concrete residential tower at the time of its construction in the 1960s. Its flower shape culminates in balconies that are half circles which extend beyond the building envelope, creating very deep recesses and a variable texture that rewards moving around the building and looking at it from different vantage points. Now that we've taken a look at some qualities of individual buildings, which might affect the reading of a city skyline, let's look at a few patches of skyline itself in the wild to assess how it works. This is a skyline as seen from the Shedd Aquarium, located right next to the Field Museum south of Grant Park. Let's pick this patch right here and take a closer look. Here we're seeing the Congress Hotel, 311 South Wacker just behind it, the one that looks like a giant engagement ring. Then you have the Willis Tower, the Board of Trade Building, AT&T Corporate Center, the Federal Building, and Roosevelt Tower here in blue, and then the CNA Tower in red. Each building is unique, but you're able to make out some larger connections between them visually, so that each one doesn't seem like it's completely distinct or completely on its own. For instance, there are a few dynamic angles occurring, one set from the changing heights of the buildings, and then the other from the depth and layering of the buildings in the distance. All these angles crisscross one another, drawing our eyes across and back. The buildings in the foreground are much older and made out of stone, terracotta, or brick, while the ones behind are mostly glass and steel. In this way, the buildings behind almost look like they're blank backdrops, featuring the buildings up front. But at the same time, the Sears Tower is completely dominating this view due to its height and dark silhouette. So there is a dual reading here. One is that the buildings in the foreground are the feature because they have more detail and they're closer, and the other reading is that the tallest, blankest building is actually the most important. Here's where I think this picturesque understanding is so crucial. You have the interplay of a few different variables. When seen in isolation, that one variable might have a clear hierarchy to it. But because there are multiple variables at play at any given time, there's a competition of sorts. But it's also an interplay and a collaboration. They play off of one another. That's clearly seen in the pair to the right, where one building is blue and the other one is bright red. None of the other buildings really play with color all that much. But these two form a pair. 
that make an arrangement or an agreement of sorts to use bold colors together to create a visual dialogue or a composition. In fact, I learned that this strategy of pairing buildings is actually quite common. What's iconic here is that we're looking at, um, at two residential towers that mirror each other. This was a concept that in its time was fairly popular. In fact, the Hancock Center, which is over our, our model over here, uh, is a 100-story tower that when it was conceived was also conceived as two uh, twin structures next to each other. Ultimately, I think there's two important ways that a skyline filters into our brain to make a strong impact. The first has been what we've talked about, the ability to create a picturesque and pleasing visual experience. But the second has more to do with how you, likely those images are to stick inside of your mind. Will you remember what a city looks like when you conjure up thoughts about it? That's again where the importance of a particular views come into play. Each view forms a snapshot in your memory. Do all these clear views all look completely different? Or is there sufficient overlap so that you can piece together a mental image of the city? From any side, you can make out that this is Chicago. It's mostly a single clump anchored by two very tall and unique structures. The city emerges from the prairie or the water from miles away even, making it a clear visual destination. It's even visible from all the way across Lake Michigan on the dunes of Michigan, 53 miles away, even though you only see the tippy tops of the buildings from that distance. Part of this, too, is a kind of mental image of the city as a result of the prairie crashing right into Lake Michigan and kind of turning upwards. Chicago has a skyline that burns into your brain as a recognizable and iconic construction. Um, if you are coming in from the suburbs, you're going to see that the whole skyline kind of emerges like a giant uh, wave of construction uh, off in the distance, kind of like the land and Lake Michigan are pushing up against each other to create a sort of a mountain range. This video would not have been possible without Brilliant. I was just doing a puzzle on Brilliant that let me practice logic for robots on a trip to Miami, presumably to admire the urban skyline. Brilliant teaches and challenges you with progressive and interactive programs, puzzles, and exchanges that make learning feel more like entertainment. The robot travel puzzles had me arranging the robots and seating configurations that dealt with their individual seating preferences. When I couldn't get the answer, I could walk through the explanation and it totally made sense. Brilliant has lessons for everyone. You don't have to be an architecture professor like me. There are life applicable topics to match your curiosity and Brilliant offers a community to help inspire and keep you excited about learning. And look, I am generally not a puzzler at all. I don't even have a single game on my phone. Instead, what I'll do is I'll start a lesson with Brilliant on my computer on a lunch break, then pick up where I left off on my phone while I'm waiting somewhere else. And you can too with a deal that we worked out together. For the first 200 people to click on the link in the description, brilliant.org slash Stuart Hicks, will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. So start playing and learning with Brilliant today. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting that like button. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so, and you will be rewarded with videos about the built environment just like this one every other Thursday. While you're waiting for the next one, check out some of these others. See you over there.